God's glory is on tour in the skies. God craft on exhibit across the horizon. Madam Day hosts classes in the morning. Professor Knight lectures at each evening time. Their words aren't heard, their voices aren't recorded, but their silence fills the air. Hi everybody, my name is Phil Driscoll. Welcome to The Awakening. Get ready and fasten your seat belts. Because we're going to have a blast today. I'd like to introduce you to a friend that's been a friend of mine for about maybe 40 years. His name is Dr. Mark Messines. He's a wild man. Where, where I play the trumpet and musicians only count to four, Mark counts to four billion, because his background is microbiology, besides being a medical doctor. Because so many people, they put God in some kind of religious bag, and, and you know, the world that doesn't know Jesus think you're crazy when you believe in him, but you're crazy if you don't. So I've asked Mark to just come, and we're just going to have fun together, and when I've heard him talk about science and the body and how God's created so much, it makes me want to stand up and cheer. And many times it makes me want to worship. So let's just believe for God to touch you wherever you are. Father, we believe right now that you're going to take this time and fling the sounds out around the world to touch people that might not ever have been touched, and to encourage those that believe in you, in Jesus' name. Mark, welcome. Thank you. Are you ready? Having, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> well, talk to me. I know you, we've talked about so many different things, but just, just take it and just talk about whatever's on your heart in terms of, you, you have such a great ability to, to cause the science that God put together, it's like, it's like, is God not a scientist? Are you kidding? If he can compute the length, breadth, and height of the earth by a grain of sand, he's got the whole deal figured out. So talk to me, man. Well, <laughs> it's a great subject. You know, when uh, investigators investigate a crime scene, many times they're looking for signatures. They're looking for fingerprints, uh, today we look for uh, fragments of DNA, which uh, that science has revolutionized our ability to be able to identify people that are, uh, that have been present uh, in a certain uh, scene, in a certain place. And I think that we now have the ability to uncover fingerprints, God's fingerprints, in a way that we haven't been able to in the past. And uh, as we've gotten better at it, the fingerprints have revealed more and more to us. Like what? Well, first of all, that God is, God is present. That what we see, no matter what volume element you want to talk about, whether it's the size of the entire universe, galaxy clusters, which are multiple galaxies together, our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, our solar system, our planet, all the way down to the volume of a cell, uh, which uh, we are made up of trillions of cells. And then you look inside that cell and you see fingerprints as though uh, someone's been there. And that is, that is what excites me and uh, it makes I think all of it makes sense. There's a theme, there's a unity to it. And uh, I was not raised necessarily to believe that way or to see that. But the more I went on in my education uh, and the more I learned, the more obvious it was that there was a fingerprint of a divine intelligence on what we call reality. 
And to me, that makes me very excited. So does that mean that the reality of God is visible in every cell? Well, I think this, there's a signature, not to steal uh, the title from uh, Steve Meyer uh, at the Discovery Institute, Signature in the Cell, but there is a signature, absolutely. There's a signature of a grand intelligence that, that is so interesting because it mirrors and emulates our intelligence, meaning that we see things in life that are very similar to what humans create. And uh, Say that again. Well, we see things inside the cell, for example. We see nanotechnology, we see machines, we see factories that are very similar to what man has created. You gotta say it one more time. So inside a cell, there's a factory? What would you do if you looked inside the cell and you saw railroad tracks, and you saw cranes, and you saw electric motors, and you saw assembly sets, and you saw factories that took a product, uh, just like uh, Henry Ford's automotive factories. And you start with a frame, and by the time the the frame uh, exits the factory, you've got a brand new motor car. And that's what happens in a cell. Of course it does. Uh, we see those types of those types of modifications. And so what we see is something that we, as humans, recognize. It is. It is intuitive to us that this is, this is the signature of something that we would recognize because we would do the same thing and have done the same thing. And it's when I began to see that. And uh, of course, you know, I didn't possess the lexicon at first of how to really describe these things. But when I did, to me, it would have taken uh, really just a, a denial. I would have had to have made a decision of my will to say, no, that does not uh, s signify an intelligence. And so uh, as I began to see that, it really made sense to me, okay? And you know, as I look at the fine structure of life, and, and of course it's getting finer and finer as our tools get better and better, um, I see I worship God. Oh, For me, as a, I, uh, as a believer, and I see those details, and it, it may sound trite to some people, but I realize how much God loves us and how much forethought went into our design. Um, it's not simple. It's marvelous. And I think that it is a form of worship. It really is, as you look at those sort of things. Boy, I believe it, man. I know, I know you're involved with Hugh Ross. And I know that the first time I ever heard him talk about the heavens and the handiwork of God, it made me want to just stand up and, and worship him. It made me aware of a new paradigm that I, as a believer, I mean, I grew up, you know, my dad was a minister. I grew up in the church. but it seemed like there were many missing ingredients scientifically, because if you, if, I mean, music is a science, right? A, a chord is, a, is, a, is an equation, right? And there's so much of that evident in the universe. And when we sort of pull that away, I think we take, we take a large part of who God is and what he's accomplished outside of the equation. I, I, gotta re, I gotta read you this verse, because I, I was reading the other day in Hebrews, and, and you know, it, God doesn't speak King James unless you do, but King James is a, is a way that a lot of people relate to God. But it said, who being the bright, Hebrews 1 verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And you know, that, that part that says he upholds all, he upholds the world by the word of his power. 
And I, I, I read, because I have a, an Amplified Bible and a King James Bible, and I, I begin to read the Amplified, which I tell people is God's favorite translation because He likes it loud. But it said, He, Jesus, is the sole expression of the glory of God. To a musician, we have what we call an expression pedal, right? And when a musician plays a keyboard or a guitar or whatever, you know, a, a, an instrument that's not acoustic, he has an expression pedal to, to, to make an increase in the impact that people perceive when they hear the sound. In other words, you know, it's like, a, it's like an ebb and flow. So an expression pedal causes a person that's listening to be impacted greater, okay? So when it says that Jesus is the sole expression of the glory of God, the light being, the light being. And you know, whenever I hear light as a musician, I know that music travels in the slow, sound travels in the slowest spectrum of light, right? In other words, it's radio waves which are the slower expression of light, but it's a part of light. And so when the Word says that in Him is light and there is no darkness, to me as a musician, I go, in Him is music. Because when you, when you study, because I've, I've, I've studied music my entire life. Music's been my life. And when I finally figured out that God didn't create music, He is music. There's no reference in the Bible where God created melody, harmony, and rhythm. But it does say that He created in Lucifer all of those things. So he ha you can't put it in, you can't give someone something you don't have, right? So when I looked at that and I goes, wait a minute. The light being, He is the sole expression of the glory of God. The light being, the outraying, and that's the literal Greek. He is the outraying or radiance of the divine. And He is the perfect imprint perfect imprint and very image of God's nature. And here's the thing, upholding and maintaining and guiding and propelling the universe by His mighty word of power. Now, Mark, take it from me. You know scientifically a lot more than I do from that point of view, but we know the universe is expanding. Is that right? It appears to be, yes. Talk to me. Well, um, you know, I'm certainly not an astrophysicist, but I've read a lot of them. And, uh, and we, you know, that was a great discovery, you know, in the n late 1920s when Edwin Hubble, and this, is, this is well known, this is common knowledge, uh, looked through his Mount Wilson telescope and saw that uh, the universe was expanding. The galaxies were moving away from each other. Uh, this was a huge surprise, and, you know, it was a huge surprise to Einstein. Uh, he, brought, he actually brought Albert Einstein to his observatory, showed him, let him look through the telescope, and showed him the signature of expansion. So Ooh. yes, we live, <laughs> we live in a universe that's expanding, and by extension, as a result of that, the great uh, Belgian physicist, uh, Georges Lemaitre, who was actually a, uh, I believe he was a monk or a priest, he was a Catholic priest, but he was also an astrophysicist, uh, was able to show that if the universe is expanding, it's, it's got to be expanding from a point. And that, those were the rudiments in the beginning of scientists to begin to contemplate the notion that the universe had a beginning in time. You see, prior Ooh. to that, starting with... <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Man, wow. I'm telling you. <laughs> I think that, uh, that may be an amen, I That's hope. That's right. But prior to that... Say that last one, the universe is expanding. The universe is expanding, and then by an extension, if it's expanding, I would say that most scientists believe uh, that the universe has a beginning in time. Yes. Okay? Yes. But what's interesting about that, and uh, this is spoken about a lot, you know, starting with Aristotle and maybe even before him, the prevailing view was that the cosmos, which is a Greek term, by the way, was eternal, that it had always been and it had no beginning and end. 
And Say that, that again. That the, the cosmos, cosmos was eternal. It had no beginning in time. Yes. And it had no end. And um, that it had always been. And that philosophy, that belief reigned right up through the 1920s. Even Einstein himself uh, believed that. Immanuel Kant, the great Prussian philosopher, uh, taught that the universe was eternal. And so that was just an accepted fact about the universe. Interestingly enough, it was the theologians, it was the first chapter of Genesis that proclaimed that the universe, that space and time had a beginning, yeah. that it had not always been. Uh, early medieval theologians called it creation ex nihilo, which meant out of nothing. And uh, lo and behold, the last century uh, has verified that very fact. But that notion is, is I would say, pra I believe it's uniquely a Judeo-Christian notion, okay? And it comes from the pages of our Bible. So that's very exciting. The universe is expanding, but I think it's also important to note that if it's expanding, it had to expand from some place. From some place. And it had to, uh, uh, astrophysicists refer to that uh, as a singularity. It's a beginning. And it's a singularity that uh, for all intensive purposes, everything that we know, matter and energy and even space itself, that three-dimensional notion of height, width, and length has a beginning and time. I failed to mention that. That's one of the great discoveries that Einstein gave us that the notion of time itself is wrapped with in this beginning. And you know, it's almost, diff it's almost impossible to talk, but there was a time when there was no time. Now we can't really appreciate Because that. if there wasn't a beginning of time, with, with the beginning of time, by definition, says that there was a time when time wasn't. That's correct, and I find, <laughs> that's right. And of what? course, you know, given the way we're made and our uniform and repeated experiences in this world of, of, of time, it's difficult for us to, to really conceive of that. But yet I can in the sense that God refers to himself as timeless. Yes. And he's all, he is, you know, he, he, he's the alpha and the omega, but he also says, I have no beginning and I have no end. And so in biblical terms. That's the God terms, that we serve. That's the God, that's that, the we God serve. that we serve. And that's very consistent now with what we understand about reality. It's very consistent that there would be an agent outside of space and time who called space and time into existence. But he had to be outside of it. He had to and be. when I when those things became obvious to me, and maybe obvious is the wrong word, but when I certainly ascended to those notions, when the revelation or the impact of it dawned upon absolutely, me. it it made all of my learning and the the relationship that I had with my Creator, it brought it together. It gave it a unity. One of the things that Mark and I've talked about is that. So many young people that even attend church that have a relationship with Jesus, when they get out of the church and they start in college and they start dealing with professors who are anti-God in their concepts, in their beliefs, there's a, there's a statistic, and you may know the statistic, but many, many young people have lost their faith by the end of the first year of college because so much of it has been so much of God has been berated by supposed science that disproves God. And that, that's the essence of ludicrousy. And that's one of the reasons that I think it's so important, Mark, in these times that, that, you, that you set that forth. But I want to I just say again, think about it from what Mark just said. This verse, upholding God, uh, Jesus, upholding and maintaining maintaining and guiding 
and propelling the universe by his mighty word of power. And then you get this picture, at least I get this picture of God who has put the universe together, flung the stars, the galaxies, all of this thing, created time and space, and guides it and propels it. And then the end of that verse, listen to this, I have to, I have to say it. When he had by offering himself accomplished our cleansing of sins and riddance of guilt. In other words, not only was he propelling the universe, <laughs> upholding the worlds by the word of his power, but he, he turned on earth and gave himself, died a criminal's death, paid for our salvation, paid for our guilt, paid for all of our sin, and sat down on the mag at the majesty on high. Now, that, if that doesn't paint a picture of how big, how great, how wonderful our God is, I don't know what picture could ever paint it. If you're out there and you are struggling with your faith, talk to them, Mark. You know, um, if you are struggling with your faith, that's natural. And um, I think we all do. And if you don't, you're not asking the right questions. So I don't have a problem with that. Uh, I remember being in university and kind of praying as I sat in class and asking God, are you ever gonna give us answers? Because I felt like I didn't really have uh, answers that I thought were credible when it came to the scientific world that I trafficked in. And what I would like to say to anybody that's there, if you are open-minded, and that's a big if, you will see, I believe, the evidence, the preponderance of the evidence. Nothing's a slam dunk. It never is on either side. But I believe that the preponderance of the evidence will lead you to a place that you see God. I believe it. You know, and the, the only thing that, you know, you cheat is yourself if you're not open. And I would just like to say that, you know, my beloved professors, men and women, I loved them. They had devoted their lives to science. Many, if most of them were not believers. But you know, this is not a matter of evidence anymore. It's a matter of world view. It is. It's not evidence. If it were evidence, I would go where the evidence leads me. And I think that's really the question. The question is, will you go where the evidence leads you? And I see a lot of people struggle with that because as we say, science says nothing. Scientists do, and they say it out of their own biases and presuppositions. And you know, scientists have biases and presuppositions. But if you will allow yourself to go where the evidence leads you, then I think you're being true. And I would predict that you would go and you would find God. Because I, and you know, we, it's not contrived. We don't have to put him there. He's there, he's there. And I meet men and women from around the world that are very renowned scientists who now are having the courage to say, yes, I'm going where the evidence leads me. But just on a lay level, for those of us that just live every day and live our lives, we're not in the laboratory and we're not doing bench science, but we're watching TV and we're being fed this and fed that. There's enough evidence that if you go where it leads you, it'll lead you to your creator without, in my mind, without much doubt. I believe it. So open up your heart and let His power touch you, no matter where you are. And if you do, you'll understand how great is His love to you, how great is His plan for you. You're not an accident going somewhere to happen. You were designed by the master designer.
to cause your life to blossom, to cause you to be fulfilled. No matter what business you're in, business will never fulfill you. Money will never fulfill you. Only Jesus will fulfill you. I'm Phil Driscoll. This is Dr. Mark Messonine. We pray that this time has touched your life. If it has, we've done our job. God bless you. Boy, I've enjoyed this time. It's my hope and prayer that you have been impacted by the sounds. Really, I believe by the sounds of heaven. You know, when you look at it and you study Lucifer, he was in charge of atmosphere control in heaven. That's what his job was. If you read Ezekiel, you'll find that he had melody, harmony, and rhythm built in him. He didn't have a band, he was the band. And boy, when I look at songs that magnify and uplift and point us in God's direction, those songs have a heavenly dimension. And that's what I've given my life to do. In this week's special CD offer of $30, Phil would like you to have Make Us One and In His Presence, two of his greatest CDs. As an additional bonus, you will receive The Spirit of America with Phil's own unique performances of the greatest songs of our nation. And you know, it's, it's my prayer that you will put music in your atmosphere, in your world, in your car, in your homes that really bring God's presence. I'm not talking much about it, but you can go to our website. It's www.fieldriscoll.com. And all of my music is there and downloadable, which is wonderful. So you can do it no matter what part of the world you're watching this in. And then years ago, God dealt with me about songs about our country. And I did a CD called The Spirit of America. And you know, the spirit of America, when you think about it, America never would have existed except some God-fearing men that had a relationship with the Lord said, you know, we should create a country that will allow people to worship freely with their choice of worship. And you know, that's what happened. That's where the United States of America exists. We can't ever forget it. I want to make that my free gift to you as you get these CDs. God bless you. I'll see you here or there in the air.